Welcome to today's Seattle Kraken Q&A. I'm Lauren Kirschman, the Kraken beat reporter for the Tacoma News Tribune. I'm joined by Seahawks beat reporter and hockey fan, Greg Bell. Uh, this is an exciting week for the NHL's newest expansion franchise. During Wednesday's expansion draft, the Kraken selected a player from every team in the league other than Las Vegas, and those players will form the foundation of Seattle's inaugural roster that will take the ice in October. The Kraken built a solid foundation mixed with veteran leadership and young talent. Uh, they left some bigger names on the table, passing on Montreal goalie Carey Price, for example, in order to save cap space. Uh, and they've already made a few moves since then. And, and right now, the Kraken have $30.7 million of cap space available to make a splash when free, free agency opens on July 28th. But before that, the Kraken will make their choices in the entry draft tonight and tomorrow to build up for what's coming in the future. So needless to say, there's a lot to talk about, and you've been sending in questions about the expansion draft, and you can send in more now. Um, so we can talk about the expansion draft, the entry draft, the upcoming season, whatever else you want to know about the Kraken. Uh, so let's get started. Well, Lauren, it's finally here, right? It's been years in the making, and they first got granted a team by the NHL that wanted to tap into Seattle's rich corporate market. Then it was the arena issue and where they were going to build it. And they finally settled on already city on land in Seattle center, redoing key arena and making a climate pledge arena. And now it feels finally real. They have players. They actually have a uniform. They have a Jersey that they unveiled Wednesday at the expansion draft that players were wearing. So now it finally, for fans, they, some, but something they can wrap around. I mean, they, they now have a, a franchise goaltender that they picked the other night in Drieger from Florida. They have Mark Giordano, a 37-year-old captain from the Calgary Flames for 15 years. It can be a centerpiece to the locker room and an anchor. But you hit on it, the fact that they have over $30 million still left to spend in free agency that begins in five days. That's the most money in the league to spend on. That's the key to what came out to me, the expansion draft. I know a lot of people want to carry price and they wanted a bunch of other big names and big salaries, but there's a reason why those players were available in the expansion draft. Teams are dumping salaries and older players who have injuries in hopes that perhaps a team like that's Seattle will take those contracts off their hands. So Seattle was smart in that they didn't just build for this year in the expansion draft. They built for five years from now with players who are 15 games and fewer in their NHL experience who cost less. And they came in just above the minimum that they had to pay for the expansion draft. There's NHL rules on how much. You can't just stock your team with kids. So they, they had to get the Giordanos and the Driegers to get above a threshold that the NHL set for salary cap. But they left themselves with the most money in the league to go out and buy if they want to, on top of having the second overall pick in tonight's regular draft. So I know a lot of fans were a little frustrated or more than a little that they didn't get Carey Price coming off the Stanley Cup run like Vegas got Mark andre Fleury a couple of years ago from Pittsburgh in its expansion draft. But we'll talk about how this expansion draft was different than Vegas was set up for success in its first year four years ago. There's a lot to talk about here because, as you said, they are just starting and, and the, 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 the slate is completely blank, which is really unusual in professional sports. Yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, they um, they really struck, I felt, uh, a pretty solid balance um, in their picks in the expansion draft. Like you said, they got the experienced guys that they needed to kind of build that veteran presence and, and have guys in the locker room and guys with experience on the ice. But they also got a real uh, some really exciting young prospects um, that they can kind of build on and keep for the future. And I think that that was the key. That was the biggest thing that came out of the expansion draft for me um, going in. It was kind of a question of what kind of strategy were they going to take? Were they going to go after those big names and maybe take on those higher salaries and not have as much money to spend in free agency? And they decided that they didn't want to go that direction. Um, they still got some bigger names. They still got some veteran guys, uh, but they also have a nice young group that they'll be able to build on and maybe have a solid team here um, in the future. Uh, I think Vegas went a little bit differently. Um, like you mentioned, they got a lot of those um, bigger names uh, and kind of star quality in their first draft. And then they obviously went to the Stanley Cup final in their first season. 
um, and have been to the playoffs every year ever since. So that's one way to go about it. Um, I don't expect that the Seattle team is going to have the same kind of success in their first season um, that Vegas did, but I think that they have started to piece together kind of the players they need to build a really solid foundation and build on it for the future. And I expect them to come out and have a pretty solid first season, but I don't expect, like you mentioned, for them to have that kind of amazing success right out of the gate that Vegas did. And that's a high bar. That's going to be the bar that the Kraken <laughs> is going to be judged against the Vegas Golden Knights of 2017 going to the Stanley Cup final in their very first year. But as I mentioned, they had Marc-Andre Fleury, who had also won, already won cups as a goaltender for Pittsburgh, and he comes right in and does the same thing, goes to the Stanley Cup Finals with Vegas. Carey Price, to me, told me what this Fran what Ron Francis and it's his staff and Todd Lewicki, what they were going to do when they didn't, when they passed on Price, who was available, who, who waived his no relocation clause with Montreal. He would have cost $10 million a year against the salary cap for the next five years. There's whispers in Montreal that he needs surgery, leg surgery for chronic injuries that have kept him from playing every night the last couple of years. We saw in the Stanley Cup playoffs what any goaltender, any hot goaltender, but do it. Carey Price carried them to the Stanley Cup finals. So it was an attractive fish out there for the Kraken to go after. But the fact that when they didn't pick him, Lauren, that told me where this team was oriented, not for 2021 to win a cup and then figure out their salary cap hell after that, but to build with the expansion draft. As they don't have a farm system, for instance. I mean, Every team in the league, the other 30 team, 31 teams, they have a farm system, right? They have an AHL affiliate. They have players they have drafted previously who have yet to play for them. Seattle has none of that. And so they needed to draft and thinking that way as well. And those are names that fans don't hear and don't know. So when they don't get carry price and they get two or three prospects, five or six prospects at the cost of carry price for one year, fans get a little turned off about the fact, well, we could get carry price. They are building a franchise foundationally, and then they still have the $30 million to go get those type of names. I mean, Alex Govetskin could be a free agent in the market next from the Washington Capitals, and everyone knows how the world of worldly talents he has. To me, that's where Seattle won in the expansion draft, is to keep their flexibility to do what they want to do now in, in free agency, can make trades, and oh, by the way, they have the second overall pick tonight. Uh, my first question, Lauren, to you is, when you were watching the expansion draft, and what a hoo-ha that was down at Gasworks Park, right on the water on national television, what became obvious to you as the 30 picks were rattled off and they didn't take price and they didn't take this guy and that guy that fans knew? Yeah, I mean, kind of the same thing that you mentioned, that they weren't going to kind of go after those bigger names and, and those splash guys that they were going to kind of, like you said, uh, take some veteran guys so they have that that foundation and, and then build towards the future. Um, another thing that became obvious uh, with the players that they did end up picking is this is starting to look like a really a defensive team, a scrappy team um, with the defenders that they got, with the defensemen that they got, um, a lot of veteran guys, a lot of versatile guys. And um, I really think that that's where the focus was there in the expansion draft. At least it seemed that way to me um, with the players that they selected. Um, and then, like you said, they're going to have an opportunity to make a big splash in free agency. And I think that there's some names out there that um, might be the names that people were looking for um, out of the expansion draft. Um, uh, those bigger names, those splash names that people are going to recognize, like they aren't done yet. <laughs> um, they've just started uh, and they have so much money to play with. Um, so the, the roster you're looking at now, the names you're looking at now, yeah, those guys, a lot of those guys will be here. Some of them won't. Um, and there's going to be more people that are, that are coming in that are going to, I think, get this fan base a little bit more excited. So I think the most important thing to remember is that there's a lot to still happen, um, and this isn't even close to really being done yet. we got a question from the Olympian Facebook account. He wants to know, she or she wants to know, what players from Sweden would be a good pick? Patrick Forsberg, I don't think, is available. What a good grinder pick. He says Daniel Torgerson, good size, good hands, would be a good fit in the third line, energy type of player, which you mentioned they've already gotten in those type of players out of the expansion draft. Alexander Holtz is a right wing. He says a good power skater. Simon Edvinson from Sweden. Uh, yeah. He, said, he says he's got a Detroit influence. The question. <laughs> <laughs> but Zetterberg, um, it's going to be hard to find a Zetterberg in the draft tonight. Second overall pick. 
pretty much the entire draft pool is available to Seattle. Lauren, where do you think they are going to go either position-wise or player-wise at number two tonight in the first round and then the yeah. su succeeding rounds on Saturday? Yeah, um, starting with the guys from Sweden, uh, Simon Evison, like he mentioned, or she, uh, is one um, that I think the Kraken have their eyes on. Um, he's ranked second among European skaters and um, just a 6'4", 198 pounds defenseman. Um, I really think that he could be a star eventually coming out of Sweden. So I think that that's a guy definitely to keep an eye on. And then another one. Uh, from Sweden is William Eklund. Um, he's one of the top available forwards in the draft, and he's considered the top European skater by NHL Central Scouting Services. Um, and he was the rookie of the year in the SHL last season. So I think those two guys out of Sweden are two to keep an eye on um, potentially tonight with the second pick. Um, but I think uh, the guy I think they're going to go with is a center out of Michigan, um, Matthew Beniers. Um, He's been the guy that's been most commonly projected to go to the Kraken with the number two pick, uh, six foot two, 175 pound center. Um, and I, I just really think that that's the guy they're going to go with. There's a, there's a few guys, three guys from Michigan who are probably going to be among the top 10. Um, and I think that that's the direction the Kraken are going to go. Uh, but there are those, uh, those two guys from Sweden that I mentioned that I think uh, could be intriguing and the Kraken could definitely go in that direction. That'll make the uh, Olympian Facebook questioner happy. He says he has a Detroit influence. You, you, interesting you say center. That is a criticism of the after the 30 picks that the Kraken made, that they're really light at center and at forwards in general. You mentioned the back line they built with. They have a couple goaltenders led by Drieger. But centers don't just fall off trees in the NHL. They're hard to come by. They're also a lot of them are protected the other night. A lot of teams weren't giving up their stop middle score <laughs> and expand the expansion job. Sidney Crosby was not available in the expansion job. No. So it, it it would make sense that you would now see this weekend they build the front and they build at center, young, cheap, well, drafting out of college perhaps. Um, that's, that's a pick that would make sense uh, just positionally. I expect them to go center, score, forward types here next on uh, the second overall pick that I didn't get on Saturday. Lauren, uh, so far dealing with the Kraken, a new job for you and new job for everybody, as a matter of fact. What, is, what have you noticed about how they're run, uh, how they're led? Todd Lightwicki's a big name in this town, in this region. He used to be the CEO of the Seattle Seahawks. I've known him for 20 years. And Ron Francis, Victor Bonus came down from Vancouver to be the second in charge behind Todd Lightwicki, the David Bonderman and the ownership group. Uh, what have you noticed that uh, how they're run? the coach they chose in the direction they seem to be setting. Yeah. I mean, like you mentioned a uh, new job for me. Um, I covered uh, the Huskies for about three years. Um, so heading in a new direction, uh, I do have some history covering a little bit of the NHL um, back in Pittsburgh. I covered the Penguins on and off. Um, so I do have some, some little bit of background uh, in the NHL, but uh, you know, I think the thing that stands out to me the most about the Kraken and the way that they're taking shape and the way that is just the way that they've really engaged the community. Um, and I think that that's so important, especially for a new team. I mean, you mentioned uh, the expansion draft and what a party and what a show that was down at Gasworks Park. And um, even with the name that they picked, uh, that was a name that fans and everybody were talking about it and really just made people excited and the way that they've unveiled everything and handled themselves. I just really think they've done a really good job kind of building up the excitement and um, I think with the coach pick, uh, it was about just experience and, like I said, building a kind of scrappy defensive team, which I think is what they've kind of set their sights on, at least here for that first season. So I think they've been consistent with uh, what they've wanted to do and, and kind of the, the team they've wanted to build and also the atmosphere they've wanted to create. And I think they've done a really good job with that. Rebecca Lee on Facebook Lauren wants to know whether it be a combined a site online, probably she means, combined with stats for all the Kraken players. She's wondering because she was told, and in Canada there are a lot of rumors about hockey, she was told the player would be going to the Kraken who's supposed to be from her hometown in Ontario. Now, as you mentioned, the roster today is not going to be the roster tomorrow yeah. or Sunday <laughs> or Monday. So, Rebecca Lee, I wouldn't get too attached to whatever this, the – the Kraken have up there, but they'll have their own website and stats on that. 
Yeah, yeah, like like you said, um, all of that will be available um, on the Kraken's website, but I wouldn't get uh, too attached to pretty much anybody right now, so uh, <laughs> um, I would wait to see uh, what that roster is going to look like um, in the future. Photo, photos Posada of Olympic of the Olympian Facebook again. Lauren, what do you think the Kraken can do to get more Portland fans involved with the Kraken? That's an interesting question get into the, uh, the uh, yeah. youth league and the, and the junior team, the, the Portland Winterhawks, that are very popular down there. Say, say down here where I live in Portland, they were not happy that no exhibition games were scheduled by the Kraken in Portland. They were scheduled, of course, in Everett, in Kent, and in Spokane, a tour of Washington, because Climate Pledge Arena in Seattle won't be ready early enough late September, early October for the three preseason games the Kraken are hosting. So they're going to be in Everett, Kent, and Spokane, but not in Portland. He says they're missing a huge community down here. What do you think of the Kraken in Portland? Yeah, I mean that's a good point. Um, that they're obviously the the closest NHL team to Portland, and um, if they continue with, I know that the exhibition games this year are mostly because the arena isn't done. But if that's a success and something that they might consider continuing with in the future, um, I think the biggest thing they could do to engage the community in Portland is to go down there and play one of their exhibition games, whether or not that'll happen, um, whether they continue or, or try to do this again um, in the future when they do have the arena available is up in the air. Um, but I think that that's an option and um, just trying to, you know, get players down there, maybe uh, engage with that community. I think that that's a good idea, um, especially there's no other team really around. And if you want to be able build a bigger uh, kind of extended fan base, engaging that community uh, would be important. So I think that if they do continue with these kind of on the road exhibition games, um, that could be something that they could do. It's the reverse Sonics effect. Of course, the Sonics, <laughs> have, the Sonics fans have had to lean on the Trailblazers down in Portland for the last decade or so after the heist to Oklahoma City of our NBA team. The NHL, really, as you know this, Lord, the NHL has really tried hard by putting a team in Seattle to establish a rivalry with the Vancouver Canucks. Vancouver has been somewhat isolated in the Pacific Northwest. The Canadians like to call it the Canadian Southwest. And they are natural rivals with Calgary and Edmonton from being in the same division for years and years. But to have a team now 150 miles away, to underscore how much they want that rivalry between Seattle and Vancouver to get going, the Kraken's very first game in Climate Prince Arena, very including preseason, there won't be any preseason <laughs> game, but the first Kraken game of event, October 23rd, the home opener is against Vancouver. And then on a Saturday night, the place will be hopping. Uh, that will be a huge, huge game. This kickoff, what they hope, is a really big rivalry. Uh, the question was about Portland, but the the intent of having a team in Seattle geographically is to have a in the same division a backyard rival with the Vancouver Canucks. Yeah, absolutely, and that's something that I uh, wrote about leading up um, to the season is that that's going to be the most natural rivalry for the Kraken and I expect it to be a big rivalry. So uh, the NHL knew what they were doing, scheduling that game um, as the home opener. Uh, it should be packed. It should be a lot of fun. Um, so that's going to be definitely a back and forth to watch for. And that is October 23rd uh, will be the home opener. And I see we have a question when the season starts, the Kraken will play their first game on the road um, against uh, Vegas on October 12th. Um, and I think that was another really good choice uh, to have them open up the entire season um, against Vegas, which of course was the most recent expansion team um, before Seattle. So I think as far as openers go, those are about the two most intriguing games you could have asked for to be on the road at Vegas and then come home um, against the Canucks. Um, I think that that was ideal scheduling for the Kraken to kind of build even more excitement about what's going on here. Uh, so I think that that will be a really fun start to the season for fans for sure. That's a, that's a five game road trip for Seattle to begin its franchise, and that's probably a hedge, obviously, against Climate Fred's Arena being done on time. So they put the Kraken on the road for the first five games. Again, the home opener is October twenty third at home against Vancouver, and then they'll play Vancouver and everybody else in their division often, <laughs> multiple times. I think it's six eight times. If you have for those of them that's new to the NHL, if you've never been to Vancouver for an NHL game. It is like a Seahawks game, but 40 nights a week, it, 40 nights a year, I should say. It is a festival. 
it is uh, always sold out. Uh, the town downtown area around the BC place now it's Rogers Place. It basically shuts down. Uh, it is quite an event. I was fortunate enough to cover the 2010 Winter Olympics in the hockey tournament throughout, from the beginning to gold medal match with Sidney Crosby gold and goal inside that arena. And I, I've been around a little bit at sporting events. I've never seen a community in a country go bonkers as they did after Vancouver, the gold medal match in Canada beating the U.S. there. It is it is quite a scene. And I think that rivalry with Seattle and Vancouver is going to be really special, not just in Seattle, but if anyone gets a chance to go up to Vancouver to follow the Kraken to play up there. Yeah. Tonight, Lauren, the second overall pick, as I mentioned, then they have the remaining rounds of the regular draft tomorrow. And then the rest of the NHL's eyes will be on free agency that starts, as you mentioned, July 28th, 30 plus million dollars, the most in the league, as we mentioned, what do you see them doing? Who do you see it spent them spending on next week? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. There's a lot of names out there, um, guys that they could potentially go after that maybe uh, other teams don't have the money to go after. And I think one of the biggest names out there um, that everybody's going to have their eyes on is uh, Colorado Avalanche Center, Gabriel Landeskog. Um, and I think that that's a guy the Kraken are going to try for, definitely, um, try to get away from Colorado so they – so Colorado doesn't re-sign him. Um, like you mentioned, uh, one of the criticisms of Seattle's expansion draft was that they were kind of light on center, didn't have a guy there. And I think that this could be the guy. Um, and they definitely have the money that they would need to make this happen. Uh, whether or not they can make it happen um, is up in the air, but that would be a huge, huge get for them. Um, and I think would kind of turn people's views around of the expansion draft if they were able to get him. Um, another guy I'll be watching for um, is a defenseman, um, Dougie Hamilton from the Carolina Hurricanes. Um, I think that he is also an option, but um, I think center is going to be a focus for them in free agency. Um, so I think that that would be a huge get. Landis Gog is going to cost money, as you mentioned. The Denver Post said that he rejected a seven-year, $49 million contract from Colorado to re-sign with the Avalanche. He was the second overall pick in 2011. What's attractive to him? He's only 28 years old. Yeah. That's a center you can still build. You can build your offense around for almost another decade. Not that he could sign him for that long. But if the Denver Post is right, seven years and $49 million, Seattle's going to have to get at least $8 million or more a year to get him. And, of course, now that he's in free agency, he's open to bidding to anyone. Seattle had an exclusive negotiation period. Yes. That ended ended with Wednesday's draft. They had about a week of exclusive negotiations, and I, I think some fans were also a little disappointed they didn't sign a Landis Gong or Tarasenko or somebody like that, from Tarasenko from St. Louis, uh, that could be an impact player that would have cost a lot of money. I think philosophically and strategically they decided not to spend then because they wanted to see where the expansion draft settled them, how they came out of the draft, and still have the $30 million to perhaps spend. Now the problem, of course, is it's not exclusive. They're going to be bidding against the rest of the league. But uh, Landis going very, very attractive, I think, because of his age, on top of the fact you're getting a captain and frontline score from one of the most explosive teams in the NHL in the Colorado Avalanche. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, obviously <laughs> Seattle's not going to be the only team interested in him. Um, right. But what they do have working in their favor, as we've talked about a lot uh, here today, is they've got the money um, that a lot of teams just don't have right now. So um, that's going to be really interesting to watch. And as I mentioned at the top, free agency opens July 28th. So we're really – just getting started here as far as adding players and figuring out what rosters are going to look like. So there's a lot more on the way, uh, <laughs> figuring all of that out. But so that's something to start watching um, after the entry draft tonight, uh, attention will start turning towards free agency. Uh, Lauren, this is an interesting question off Twitter, off my Twitter account from uh, someone who goes by the name Gunnar Soros. Always be careful of mentioning Twitter handles, but he, <laughs> He wants to know why Ron Francis, the general manager, seemed to be caring more about preserving friendships. He, of course, used to be with Carolina a long time, and he was in the NHL as a player for decades. Why Ron Francis seemed to be more concerned about preserving friendships with other front office types in the NHL than, quote, blackmailing other teams into side deals. What, 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 can you explain what they mean by that? 
Uh, yeah, um, I think what they're talking about is if you look back on the 2017 expansion draft with Vegas, um, there were a lot of side deals that were made um, for teams so that they could guarantee that Vegas would take a particular player in the expansion draft. For instance, Mark andre Fleury. Uh, the Penguins made a deal um, to make sure that uh, Flurry was the player that they selected, and Vegas got a lot of players that way, a lot of really good players that way, um, outside of just the players that they took in the expansion draft, and they got a lot of prospects, they got a lot of picks. A lot of those deals were made, and that's something that I wrote about heading into this draft, which was that I didn't think that that was going to happen this time around, um, and I don't think it had much to do with preserving friendships. I think it had more to do with the fact that NHL GMs learned a lot of lessons from that 2017 expansion draft. Um, they were able to look back and see the kind of players that Vegas got out of those deals and the success that Vegas had. And I don't think that they were as willing to make those side deals this time around. Um, I said that I expected teams to kind of deal more with each other, make deals with each other instead of just pretty much solely dealing with the expansion team and giving them the opportunity to um, bring in all of these players and make all of these deals. And I think that that's what you saw happen. And Ron Francis even said uh, after after the draft that the side deals that teams maybe would have made in 2017 just weren't on the table this time around. Um, so I think you just saw GMs learn a lot of lessons. Uh, they were able to look back too. Um, and I think another thing is they were able to see have more time this time around to see the expansion draft coming and they didn't have as many, there were still some for sure, but they didn't have as many salary cap issues um, as they did the last time around players they had to get rid of for those reasons. Um, so I think that there are, people learned a lot of lessons and, and that was the difference uh, in 2020, 2021. What year are we in? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Graham Byatt, Lauren, has an interesting question from Twitter. We, we heard Ron Francis the other night talk about the analytics. He's talked about from the last year about the analytics team that the Kraken have built and how cutting edge they are in scouting and on analytics and numbers and quantitative analysis. So Gra Graham Byatt of Twitter wants to know, are the Kraken going to be run like a money ball team? Deference course, to Billy Bean and the A's and their embrace of analytics in the 1990s. Yeah. I don't know if it'll be uh, quite to that level, but I think that they are definitely really focused on analytics. Um, if you've heard them talk, they've talked a lot about kind of having a balance between a focus on analytics and looking at players that way and also a focus on just what you can see with your eyes and how players are um, just as athletes and as people. And I think that they are looking to really strike a balance there when they're looking at players and looking at prospects. Um, they're not looking at just analytics, but um, that's definitely going to be a huge part of what they do. And I think uh, looking at the kind of prospects and the younger guys that they picked up in the expansion draft, that that was how they kind of sorted through who they wanted and, and picked up some guys to build for for the future. So um, I definitely think that that's playing a big role in the team that they're building. What are you most excited for covering this team, covering the NHL, Lauren? And, and in general, this is – as I said, it's a new frontier for Seattle sports, and the landscape seems right for it. And I, I mean, they have 13,500 season ticket holders. They have hundreds of thousands of people on the wait list. It's season tickets sold out in 10 minutes when they went on sale. The place is going to be packed. It's going to be expensive. By the way, I should mention, we should mention, to the people who are not used to going to NHL games, they cost some bucks. It's hard to get into that place without $100 on per ticket, and the parking issue around Seattle Center and the concessions. I remember, Lauren, when I was – I'm a little older. I remember paying $8.50 to sit on the ice, on the glass, in the corner at the Civic, old Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, Mario Lemieux's rookie year in the 80s. You couldn't even buy a hot dog for $8.50 at an NHL game right now. Uh, that aside, that, and it is a rich man's game in person, and if you're lucky enough to get in for less than $100, you consider yourself fortunate. This place is going to be jumping. This town is going to be jumping for it. What, what are you expecting, either at the beginning of the season, as it goes through, when the Seahawks are playing, the Huskies are playing football at the same time? How do you expect this to go down October, November, December? Yeah, I think it's going to be really a lot of fun. You know, I've never um, been a part of 
a first season for a team uh, uh, covering an expansion franchise. Uh, it's really exciting just to be here for seeing all of the pieces come together, see the arena come together, seeing the roster come together, the coaches, um, seeing the excitement from fans. And I, I just think I, it's, it makes me happy that they're going to be able to start the season and actually have fans um, in the arena and have it packed and really being able to enjoy the launch of this. Um, I think that that's going to be probably the most fun part is just the excitement that's going to be um, in the arena and surrounding this team. And uh, especially with all the buildup, <laughs> as you mentioned at the top, that there's been to creating this. Um, I just think that there's a lot of people who are hockey fans and are really excited because of that. And then there's people who maybe haven't watched a lot of hockey before, but are ready to learn it and kind of rally around this team. And it's going to be really exciting just to see how Seattle embraces this and follows this. And um, I've covered, like I mentioned, hockey in the past. I was there uh, through the Penguins, stand, most two, two most recent Stanley Cup runs covering games. And uh, when hockey arenas are really loud and <laughs> into it, it's, it's really just so exciting and, and fun to be a part of. So I'm looking forward to that. In person, the NHL game is amazing for the skill, the physical athletic skill that players have. I mean, it's hard enough for me to stand up on skates. And these guys have been skating since they were three, four years old. A lot of them Canadian. But to see the things they do athletically, jumping over sticks and hitting each other while still staying on their skates and how fast they skate and their hand-eye coordination of getting the puck and shooting sometimes. In one, it's an amazing spectacle in person. Uh, again, if you're fortunate enough to get into a game, it's an amazing experience. It's much, much different than on television. Or one thing, you can see the puck when you're in an arena. <laughs> the, uh, and, the, and, and the playing surface is so much smaller than baseball and football. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a little larger, of course, than a basketball floor. But when you're in an NHL arena, it feels intimate. Even a 20,000 seat up in Vancouver, even Madison Square Garden in New York, I've been in there thinking, wow, this feels close. And you can be in the, the third deck and still feel somewhat close to the ice because the players have gotten so big and fast and the, the rink has remained the same size, relatively smaller. One other thing to consider about all this that I think people should in the Pacific Northwest should understand, this isn't just an NHL team that's coming in. There is, they are building, they're almost done with, right up the street from where Lauren and I, uh, we live in North Seattle. and. A couple miles up the road at Northgate Center, they've turned the mall into what will be three sheets of ice for the Kraken Training Center, an $80 million complex that they built on private funds, part of the team deal. And they're going to open that up on game nights to fans to have watch parties of Kraken games on television and at the facility, at a bar, restaurant. But when they're not practicing, the Kraken are going to open those three sheets of ice for youth and adult rec leagues. And you're going to get what you have now in Seattle for AAU basketball and, and club baseball. It, you will get that in about five or ten years. The seeds will have been planted. We'll start growing the roots of a grassroots youth league organization. There are pockets of it here in Seattle and in the Northwest uh, from the Everett and the Kent teams. And, but they are, they, it's going to explode. The, kid, the eight- and ten-year-old kids that are going to want to play hockey after watching – the Kraken on television will now have three international quality ranks of sheets of ice, which I think is about three times more than they currently have in the South Seattle City District. So that is, an, I think, an overlooked aspect to all of this. And yes, the team itself is the fanfare in the arena. And, but the, the grassroots, there is going to be an entire community that doesn't exist today, starting three, four years from now, of hockey families and hockey fans and kids and Saturday mornings, games up at Northgate. And it's it's really going to be a phenomenon that I'm excited to watch and, and see. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like I mentioned that the, when we were talking about my observations of this team, it's just the organization isn't just focused on building it, building their team. They, they've really focused on exciting the fan base and kind of growing youth hockey in the area and bringing not just uh, the Seattle Kraken as a team, but hockey uh, to the Pacific Northwest and, and making sure that it's a sport that can really take root and grow here. Um, so I think it's really great that they've made that a focus and they're going to open things up. And, and I really do think, yeah, like you mentioned, that it's definitely going to grow the sport um, in the area for sure. 
Um, all right, uh, that'll do it for today's Kraken Q&A. Um, thank you for everyone who watched, who sent in a question. Um, if we didn't get to yours or you think of another one, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Lauren Kirschman and all my Kraken coverage is available at thenewstribune.com. Um, you can head there for live coverage of the entry draft tonight and tomorrow and everything else you need to know about the run-up to Seattle's inaugural season. Thanks, everyone.